Good morning. Thank you so much for joining this Twitter space and the live link if you're joining us. I'm seated at the NSSF 14th floor boardroom with the acting MD Patrick. It's been a hard few days for you. I'm just going to make it harder for another <laughs> one hour. Uh, uh, but the people out there really want clarity. Also, thank you so much for making time for this. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. Yeah. I, I want, uh, first of all, I know that the first thing you do in the morning is check the fund and yes. make sure savers money is safe yes. and that you can cash it out. Mm. This morning, are, yes. our man, are our money safe with you? This morning, your money is as safe as it has been two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. And the safety of the members fund is at two levels. The first level is at the investment level because what you have to do is the money you've invested out there, the investments are actually safe on an overall basis. So we've got three classes of investments that we've had. Uh, we've got fixed income government bonds, mm -hmm. we've got real estate, and then we've got stocks and bonds. If you look at the composition of that asset mix for the last five years, mm -hmm. fixed income, which is the safest securities, have mm -hmm. ranged between 77 to 79% of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, equities have ranged about 14 to 16%, mm -hmm. and real estate has been around 7%. That has been constant. So from an investment perspective, the money is safe mm -hmm. because there is nothing that has changed at, a, at a, the asset mix level. You know, the, the investment perspective is really for you, the yes. one that's running the fund. Yes. Right? Speak to me about the payout perspective. Mm -hmm. Has anyone walked into the fund and failed mm -hmm. to get their money? No. In fact, I do even have an interesting set of numbers. As of, I think, yesterday, mm -hmm. I think yesterday for just the month of February, we paid around 40 billion shillings. And we're paying them in shorter and shorter time frame because uh, the process of work through are enabling us to do that. So nobody who wants their money, who is eligible for their money, will fail to get their money. Mm. Patrick, let's start this right now. Um, there is a lot of people debating what the fund should do and what the fund can do, but what exactly is the mandate of the fund? What is it that you wake up in the morning to do and under the laws of Uganda, what is it that you, you have to do? Uganda as a country is a member of the International Labor Organization, ILO. Mm -hmm. In 1952, ILO came up with what they call the minimum standards to provide social security to its, to its members, to its member countries. One of the pillars, or one of the course will be like healthcare, one of them will be disability, education, then there is pension or retirement. So that's one of the pillars. Now what each country then did was to craft within their own laws how they are going to meet that minimum standard. So in Uganda we've got the public pension sector which deals with the public servants. Then for the private sector to provide the retirement, NSF was then created as part of that. So when you look at the overall mandate we have as a fund is to provide retirement benefits to especially people who have finished working after the work life. Now we do that basically, the way the law was crafted in Uganda is you collect benefits, you invest benefits, then when the members become eligible, you pay out those benefits to the members. That's basically the model that we have. And is that, is that a model that you're comfortable with uh, as someone that's been, based on your experience, running the fund? Um, is it a model that you would suggest some modifications to or it's a model that's working? The only thing that I see as a country we need to address is this. And I'll give you a number that is a bit scary. Social security is part and parcel of the labor market. It touches on the labor market. We have right now about 80% of our members with less than 10 million shillings in balances. So maybe somebody has been working maybe for the last 20 years. He's 55, he comes back and gets 8 million because the labor market is structured. People don't work all the time people drop in and out of work, we don't have any safety networks, so there's a bigger issue we need to solve if people are going to have some level of retirement when they expire. Mm -hmm. But also the thing that the amendments addressed is to allow us on our own now to say, okay, you know, 15% of my salary is not going to be enough for me to retire on. Let me begin to save some more. So at least mm -hmm. we've addressed that part of it that was, was lagging behind what we need to do. Mm -hmm. If we do that and we fix our labor market, 
then that actually is a model that works. Mm. Uh, you speak of the labor market. There, there are two people that supervise you, the, the Ministry of Finance yes. and the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Yes. Um, more recently, the problems have been coming from the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Yes. But being supervised by these two entities, um, what has that taught the fund? about working with those entities and about listening to them because they act in public interest? Interestingly enough, Uganda is not the only country that does a complex um, dual reporting role. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Malaysia has actually got two boards. One board for investments, one board then to cater for everything else and so on. That has been working well. And the aim behind that was to make sure that the expertise needed for a specific function is available. For example, we say with us, we collect, invest, and then give back the member. This part of investment actually requires a different set of skill set than the two. So what you have in Malaysia is a board of investments, consistent with expertise in investment area. In Uganda, what the law then, uh, then it depicted was say, okay, investments must be approved by the Minister of Finance because there's expertise there. Mm -hmm. So in terms of where they can work, if we can tap into the advantage of tapping into those two sets of uh, of investments because we have to also with social policy and labor issues, agenda issues, so they have expertise in that area. Mm -hmm. So the, the fear that they would, you, you're going to have a conflict, whatever it is, once it's working, the law is very clear what each ministry ought to do. And if we stick to that, there's no problem because it's not just unique to us mm -hmm. as a country. Uh, I, I, we'll get to your investments, and, and uh, that's an interesting area to speak about because yes. many savers are interested in that. Mm -hmm. But before we get to your investments, let's start with. The, the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. Yes. Uh, Recently, we've had, um, I mean, as savers, mm -hmm. that some of our money, to the tune of six billion shillings, was asked for for activities. Uh -huh. um, first of all, was that money approved? Has NSF approved <laughs> any kind of that money <laughs> okay. to go out for activities? And, and, and is that regular like under the corporate government structure? I'm going to answer it at two levels. I think mm -hmm. what we've kind of got lost into it, we've thought about it as a one-step process. Mm -hmm. The law has given the minister the response and the right to amend our budget and propose and suggest. That's that. The minister of gender was right to do that, propose an amendment in the budget. The second stage then was to come up with a list of activities that those amendments would meet to meet the objective that she set out. That part of it is what's now going through. The board has not yet, appro has not yet has not, uh, approved those set of activities yet, plus allocated money for it. And remember, the outcome of it is increased coverage, and number two, increased compliance. And the set of activities mm -hmm. that will be undertaken. This second part of it has not been done. So in terms of the step, when you look at from that step, the budget, the minister proposed an amendment. Now the board, through management, is developing activities for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Then when that is done, that's when money will begin to go, begin to fund the activities managed by the fund. Mm -hmm. People kind of misunderstood it, took it, whatever it is, but that's the process in place at this point in time. Mm -hmm. you, you made a fantastic case explaining to me the Malaysian pension fund, yes. how they arrange the investment mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the NSSF investment. Okay. Uh, how, do you, how are you structured? How do you approve investments? Okay. Who suggests those investments? Um, how are they monitored? Okay. How do we get our payback from them? Right. On an overall basis, kind of uh, the global market, we've got UBRA, which is the regulator. They've issued what we call investment guidelines mm -hmm. that each pension fund needs to be considering as they do that. So we have that overarching guideline for UBRA. Then, we develop what we call the investment policy statement, which is our philosophy of investments. For example, because we're a pension fund, the number one attribute that guides our investment is safety. Because you want, when the member has saved with you for the last 20, 25 years, the money is there when they come. So safety is really critical. So that is going to be embedded in the investment policy statement. When we move from the investment policy statement, then we come to what's called strategic asset allocation. Now, all these are papers that tell you what's the mix of assets that will give us the best safety, the best return to the member, given a certain level of risk. And for us, it says, okay, for us, we want to be able to invest in government paper, and the rate will reduce the value of the asset We need to invest in real estate to bring this rate to that rate. That gives us the strategic asset allocation, and we review that budget every year to make sure that it's in line given the government condition that comes through. 
after that, then you go to processes and procedures that allow, okay, how do you identify a stock that is viable? How do you analyze it? We've got what we call benchmark returns for seed in every investment, whether it's real estate, whatever it is, and assessments are there are done by that. Now, many times you'll scan the region and look at what share, what stock is doing very well in what area. Because that's what you have the site to do. Sometimes somebody is throwing you something, there is land here you want to consider it and so on. Sometimes you ignore it, sometimes you Thing. But that's where the, the mix comes from. Once the investment department now narrows onto an investment proposal, they do a deep analysis. It's brought to an investment committee, they go through it. If they okay it, it goes to the IBMC, which is the board investment committee. If they okay with it, it goes to the board. Now, from that point on, it will take the parts for all your real estate and all your, I, uh, all, all your, all your private equity. Both the minister for no, no protection. So that's how then the, the, how those approvals are made. Mm -hmm. Speak to me about the, the, the Uganda Claims Investment. Yes. Um, this is a loss making company. Uh -huh. um, anyone looking at their share stock just sees this is a crisis. Uh -huh. And then it's a poor money down, um, the loss making stock. And to death, we just had from Parliament that there was no payback. Okay. I'm glad you raised the question in that case. NSSF owned Uganda Clay shares at IPO. We own 33% of Uganda Clay. That IPO was in 2001. So in 2000, I think 2007, 2008, Uganda Clay is thinking about expansion. And what about expansion? And at that point, NSF then says, okay, we lend you 11.5 billion shares to help with the expansion that has happened. They, I remember, I think they only paid, they made one payment, then they default to the now, the question you may ask yourself, which is, why did you put 11, 11 billion shillings in a loss-making entity? Because they are prospects. And the company hasn't died. Today, it has not. It's there. And by the way, it's thriving even better. And I'll tell you something that NSF did that you members actually ought to be very proud of. If it had been a private bank that had put 11 billion shillings in a in, 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 in place in 2010, and Uganda Clays did not pay in two years' time. They would have foreclosed on Uganda Clays. What would have been the implication of that? It would mean the following. Today, Uganda Clays employs over 1,000 people. That would be normal. Today, Uganda Clays contributes 1.5 billion shillings to NSF. That would be normal. 33% we own in Uganda Clays would have been normal. More importantly, we are risky. we will now restore the loan. The loan is now going to is a secure loan plus all the arrears. Mm -hmm. And they will pay secured by land mm -hmm. be, be, because Uganda Clays is becoming vibrant, it's beginning to work out. That's what's called patient capital. Mm -hmm. So when you look at pensions, you don't look at just a short term. You take a long term view. But for the sake of this nation, thank God NSF did that because that company would be the only first company we listed on our strike would have been no more mm. and the jobs would have been lost. Mm. But, but uh, what's to stop me from feeling bad because when we serve with NSF in the investment portfolio, yes. we think that you get us the best possible interest on the market from the money that you invest. Mm. So if, if, if some of recovering the best possible interest requires to foreclose on a company, a saver would say, but maybe that's what should have been done. Foreclosure, mm. you don't recover. Mm. When you foreclose, you don't recover. I mean, tell me anybody who has foreclosed and recover their full money. In fact, you lose more by foreclosing. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a hierarchy of payment. Some of the equity end, end up paying with zero, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is, if you look at the last eight, nine years, there's a promise we've made our members. We made the promise to our members. It's very explicit, and we've sung about that. Mm -hmm. We said we are going to do the following things for the fund. One, to the member, we promise what we call a real return. We'll pay you uh, 200 basis points above inflation. We made that promise eight years ago. And man, we've not broken that promise. We still do up to today. We do. We promised that we'd grow this fund to 20 trillion shillings by 2025. And guess what? We're at 18 trillion shillings now. We're still two years out. We're going to deliver that. We promise our members that our services, if you come and interact with us, whether it is online, whether it is whatever channel, whether it is by, if you come, because we wanted our members to be a 95% satisfaction rate, we are today at 83%. And we know what the other gap is. And we're going to deliver that. So every strategic promise we made to our member, 
we have kept in totality. Now, there is where, when you're investing, well, most people have made a mistake to think that, you know, when you invest, you need to get a, uh, everything 100% right. We are human beings. Let me tell you what is interesting is, any decision you make that involves tomorrow has uncertainty in it. Mm. Because tomorrow's dynamics you don't know. So you're making, making the best decision with the best information you have, knowing very well that it's partial information. It's not full information. You have full information in the past. Hindsight is 2020. The future is all about uncertainty. And you make the best decision. Some of the investments will do very well. Some will not do very well. But in totality, the fact that the fund has grown from 1.7 trillion shillings mm. to now 18 trillion shillings tells that we've made more right decisions mm. than wrong decisions. That, uh, let's talk about the decisions and, and, and whether they're right or wrong. Again, the savers <laughs> will have to decide on yes. that. Mm -hmm. You've made the decision to invest into real estate. Yes. And you've constructed some beautiful properties. Yes. Um, you gave me a number at the start of this conversation mm -hmm. about how much you pay out to each saver. Correct. A lot many savers mm -hmm. look at the investments that you've made in real estate and the cost of those investments and say, I'll never be able to own this in my lifetime, and yet it's built with my money. Uh -huh. How do you rationalize that decision to a saver? Ah, thank you. I'm going to give you one which is very, very common, Loboa. And we've never really thought about it from the perspective I'm going to share with you. Look at this building here. Yes. Patient Towers. There are companies today. Uganda says and wants to position itself as an investment destination country. We want to attract the best destinations. There are companies, your first class A companies, will not go to a country that does not have class A offices. What they do, they will come fly to Nairobi, set up their head operations in Nairobi, have a liaison office in Kampala, fly back and forth, but they're based in Nairobi. Mm. You get it? Pension Towers is one of the first class A offices. So we can brag as Ugandans, we're actually an investment destination today because of class, they are class A offices. The number of inquiries of good has been amazing because we, we, as a country, there are so many opportunities. Mm. Where are they going to stay? If you're going to have class A offices, where should they stay? Lobo is class A facilities. If they come into this country and stay in this country, who benefits? All Ugandans, correct? So when you look at that from a certain perspective, the whole country and the members benefit. But not even with this standing that we still have places where we think, if someone says, no, my pocket is not that high, we have mm. Temangalo. We're now developing Chanja. We're going to do Simbe. So there's a catering for all that. The people, the missing people don't re realize that these are strategic investments for the whole country that benefits the entire country. Mm. But at, at, at the end of the day, yes. the, on the balance sheet, yes. are those investments bringing in more money for, for the savers that are yes. saving with the fund? Remember I told you that when you're running, when we do the, our investment analysis, mm. you have a targeted internal rate of return. Mm. And as long as that's not breached, the member benefits. Mm. But you spoke to me about the pension towers. Yes. Um, I watched you before the, the parliamentary committee, mm -hmm. and, and one of the questions that just remained in the air mm -hmm. is the cost of yes. the pension towers yes. increased from 330 to 380 billion. Correct. And everyone's asking, why, why did the cost increase all of a sudden? And, and is that project still on, on course? Is it, is it a safe project? Yes. So I'll ask I read this way. When the project, the first feasibility study for the project that was done, and the, the 330, the 330, actually it was 327 billion shillings were as, as the budget for it. That was a, a project based on drawings around 2014, 2015. Technology has moved. Now this is what we call a smart building. Mm -hmm. To cater for your class A people, to cater for it to be what you want to call a smart building, worthy of its name across Africa. Those were the, where the variances came through. But still, from a, from a profitability and return perspective, it still gives us the return we are looking for. Because those guys will pay a premium for a smart building. Mm. So wh what is it about the cost that made it rise? Was no. it equipment? Was it no, no, re-strategizing? Was it redesigned? For example, when, it, when the initial design was done, I'm just going to give you an example. Mm -hmm. When the first design was made, um, mm -hmm. 
there was something they were calling, um, there were certain glass they were using. But the technology has moved so much that if you want that building to be smarter, it has to be double glazed. So we went into now, what's the, what's the benefit of doing it and put it as double glazed? So it was actually mm -hmm. money that went into the building, making it smarter for mm -hmm. basically the future. Because what you don't want to do is, you don't want to finish finishing three thirty billion dollar billion shilling building now, mm -hmm. and five years time is obsolete. When you could have invested some money, and for the next 20, 25 years, it's actually a functional modern building. Mm. Uh, let's also talk about the building that we're in. Yes. Since we're talking about the, the assets that you own. Yes. Um, you were in court with Alcon over this building. Yes. Um, you eventually won at the Supreme Correct. Court. Correct. Um, something came up during Parliament yes. that you don't have the land title for this building. Mm. I, I, I thought that was strange. No. No, because when we went to court, remember mm. the issue regarding Alcorn and the, when we went to court and the matter was resolved at the Supreme Court, we now actually began pursuing recovery of our title from there. Apparently, the lawyers in town thought they would get away from it, but we ended up with getting a special title for it. So we mm. have our own title now for this building and the members are safe. Mm. So yes. you have a title you have for the this special building? title because we had to apply for it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Nachigalala, um, yes. which is another of the areas that has been for contention. Correct. Why would you spend 400 billion on that land? Actually, no, because the price on that land is 250 billion shillings. Mm. There's another piece of land that's supposed about 150 billion shillings. The total of the two gives you uh, the 400. 400. But Nachigalala by itself is 250 billion shillings. So it was not, it was not what? It mm. was not a, uh, 400 billion. If you look at where Nachigalala is, Mm. I think right in the acre region, that thing was between 800 or something acres. Mm. Kajansi. What's the price of an acre in Kajansi? We're actually getting it for at a deal. Mm. But, like we do, we do the due diligence. There were certain issues we found on that land. And we said, no, we told the vendor, resolve those issues first before we can even think of buying okay. that land. Mm. But you had to make a budget provision for it. And there's a difference between making a budget provision and actual spending. Most people think that when you make a budget, you spend. No, not in NSF. A budget is a plan. Mm. So you haven't spent yet? No. You're holding on. No, we've not spent it because the they have to meet certain criteria one from them. Mm. Yes. All right. The, the, the other very outrageous claim um, we had from Parliament was that some days uh, when you guys are hanging on the 14th floor, <laughs> you look out for money lenders in town, give them our money, and they give you back an interest on that money. It, it's outrageous as it comes, mm. but is there any truth to that claim? The law does not allow us to lend money at all. So if you're going to look into, mm. you know, you can only lend through instruments, say government securities. So if you look in our books today, if you look at the last transactions we've had, we've not loaned any money. Any money. The law does not allow us, mm. so that's not true. But... Uh, I <laughs> It's an outrageous thing because it yeah, came from yes. someone of, of a point of authority. I just want you to assure Severs that there's not a day that Patrick or someone in finance looks at our money and says, please, this is money that we can give to a money lender and, and get it back on Monday morning. I can tell you, no. Mm. We don't do that because it would be illegal. Just, I mean, for our front it is illegal. We cannot do it. Mm. It's not, we are, so we can't even think of it because it's an illegality. Mm. And the processes that money is used, we have the way money flows from here, mm. there are several steps. There is no way you can. There's no way the CFO, the MD, must say, hey, guys, I need some money here. Send it. No, it's not there. There's a process for it. So, mm. no, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, speak to us about... Um, another of the outrageous claims. Mm. This is not even a claim because it was confirmed mm. before Parliament on, on the recruitment process yes. of NSSF. Yes. You were seated together with yes. the former MD and, and uh, the mm. key staff members of NSF yes. who confirmed that they were hiring relatives in, in the fund. That, that sounds like a corporate uh, governance ac crisis. Actually, it was, a bit un it was a bit of an unfair question to mm. that colleague of mine. Yeah. And they went to lens to explain that, you know, first of all, the fund does not say you c a relative can't come and can work here. What you have to do is disclose mm -hmm. so that you are aligned in terms of direct service and so on. So the, it allows it because you're not going to stop a competent person from there. Mm -hmm. That specific question they mentioned, I mean, he went through, well, I think one of them came before him. Mm -hmm. The other ones had joined other departments and they just ended up, being, but it is six he supervises over 308 staff 
under him. And it was a bit unfair because it seemed to show like it's a glaring problem in the fund. No, it's not. Mm. We will not stop a relative from applying, but there are procedures and processes that everybody goes through on merit to be able to get a job. Mm. Okay, away from the parliamentary committee, yes. there are other areas you know, of the fund where someone called the Auditor General, in whom the public vests interest, mm -hmm. has raised some red flags and said, I think the fund can do better on this. Which one? Areas like the suspense account. Okay. Um, okay. What are you doing in that regard? The suspense account we have has got two components. There is what we call the legacy. First of all, suspense account, having a suspense account by itself is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Ask any financial institution, they do. Because they could come where there is a detail that you don't have when that money comes in. Mm -hmm. So you hold a suspense account until you run it and get the, the details, and now you move to a regular account. So we've got those that come through, especially ends of the year. For example, when mm -hmm. we, people are sending their money by end of June, sometimes they don't send all the information. And yet we have to close our books for that year. So while the due diligence is full up is being made to get that money. And that's why you'll see, if you look at that suspense account between the end of the year and now, drastically reduces. There's no problem there. Mm -hmm. Where the suspense seems to be st static are legacy cases. We come and audit a company. We say, okay, you had Mr. W. Julia working with you. Mm -hmm. I think when we look at the number of years we've done, this is how much money you owe, Mr. W. Julia. So they send a million shillings for Mr. Wijuli. Mm. But Mr. Wijuli has not registered with us yet. So we have to look for Mr. Wijuli mm. to, to register. register. Mm. And we, the, the branches are day to day doing that. From, we put paper, we do put ads in the papers and so on. What was worse, some of the most traditional thing when we didn't have uh, national ID numbers and things like that, somebody would call old man and say, Patrick. Mm. Then he said, another Patrick, another Patrick. Just one name, Patrick. So you have got 12 Patricks with the numbers. You go back to where they used to work, these guys have no clue who you are talking about. And we still chase. The good thing with, them, with the NSF, you never lose your money. Mm. That money will, will, will hold it there. And each day we, we declare interest, you put interest on that money. One day maybe your grandchild shows up. I say, you know what? My grandfather was Patrick. He worked in a place like this. I said, show us documentation. And sure enough, you see that, hmm, this Patrick in this assessment account is a Patrick that the grandson had showed up. Mm -hmm. now, of course, you go through your administrative areas, then you'll, you'll move that money now to a regular account and they get their money. Mm -hmm. So the good thing is the money is, suspended, is not lost. It's not. Mm -hmm. Patrick, um, w when, when the onslaught of COVID-19 happened mm -hmm. and uh, the midterm um, amendment happened, yes. uh, a lot of people who qualified for their benefits mm -hmm. left them with NSSF, yes. which was first a show of good faith, but mm -hmm. also an indicator of confidence that people yeah. have in you. Yeah. What I've seen online in the last few weeks mm -hmm. is that people are worried, worried, scared about what's happening to their money. Mm -hmm. And as someone that looks at the fund every day, mm -hmm. has that affected your operations in any way? Has the parliamentary proceeding affected operations in any way? Uh, let me give you the uh, numbers. We're actually looking at the numbers this morning. Contributions, money is coming in. Uh, 147 billion shillings came in the month of January 2023. Mm -hmm. Same period last year, it was 118 billion. That's now you're comparing month to month. So members entrusted with about 30 billion shillings more in 2023 than in 2022. Mm -hmm. If you look at the payments that we've made in mm -hmm. terms of just uh, the payments, including me, time and so on, end of January we paid around 90 billion shillings. Previous period was about 40 billion shillings. When we look at people who are over the age of 55, there's not a, pal a palatable de withdrawal. Because these guys actually do understand and do know. So, no, it hasn't affected us. The only area that we, that we seem to see a bit of a difference is on voluntary. Uh, the year before, in January, we we're getting about 1.6 billion shillings mm -hmm. every month on voluntary. It's now 1.1 billion shillings. But we can explain that. Because a lot of the companies that were voluntary in January 2022, when the law changed, have become mandatory because they had less than five people. Mm. So that so there's not a palatable difference in terms of the operation. When you look at the staff operations, whether it is customer service, whether it is TAT in terms of benefit processing, we're actually doing much better than mm. we're doing a year ago. So I think, yes, people were concerned. Everybody will be concerned, the staff will be concerned. But in terms of rising to the occasion to deliver the service, 
it's mm. been okay. Mm. Uh, 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 we're going to allow the public uh, to give us some of their questions, but okay. maybe I can fill two more questions before we go to the public mm -hmm. questions. Um, there's this matter of the Grain Council. Yes. Um, first of all, has NSF paid any money to Grain Council? Have you made any investment? Zero. No, we have not. Mm. Have you considered no, an investment we, in the Grain no, Council? No, we have not. Mm. So let me explain what happened. Many of Ugandans may understand, you know this, to me or to us in the fund, mm. the biggest gap in agriculture today mm. is one area. I think we focused a lot, if you look at NADS, look at OWC, look at PDM, the underlying assumption is the problem is the farmer. So the farmer needs quality seeds, needs better equipment, needs post-harvest handling. Mm. They do need that. But the farmer grows his corn. And the first question he asks you, where should I sell my corn? And as a country, we've never really deliberately address the market side of agriculture. So farmers grow with an uncertain market. They don't know where they're going to take this thing. So a few years, actually two years ago, we began thinking that we, as an SF, we need really to intervene in agriculture. Why? Because we did a pilot in Mitiana. Mm. And we found that when farmers get a bit more money, mm. they actually are able to save with an SSF. Yeah. Now, who is the expert on farmers in this country? We talk to the Uganda, Uganda Farmers Federation. Mm. When you look at the area of grain, the Uganda Grain Council is the most, it has expertise. We've been talking with it because to understand the market and so on. That's the extent of our discussion with the Grain Council. Mm. In fact, there's an initiative we are working through with the government to see if we can actually intervene in this marketplace and bring pre predictability and certainty in the marketplace so that our farmers stop growing crops mm. that are not driven by market demands. Demand. Mm. And then you can utilize the aggregators, you can utilize the post-harvest handling. The farmer knows who is buying his crop, how much they're going to buy, when they're going to buy. We do that well with revolutionary agriculture in this country because we no longer be ad hoc and chaotic. Mm -hmm. That was the extent with the Grain Council, consulting with them and an expert. In terms of whether or not we're going to give them money, that has not even really come up. Mm. It, it, you haven't yet discussed it. No, 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 no. Because they don't need the money for for what we're what, because what we're looking at now is mm. some is, a, is an entity that would be actually be the marketing arm for Uganda's produce. Mm. Th th there's also been concern around the kind of pressurized environment that mm. NSSF is operating in. Mm. That you're probably the most profitable entity in Uganda, sitting on a large sum of money. Yes. And there's all these entities requiring money uh, mm. for their activities who say they think NSF is the place to go. And yet the savers are also thinking this is our money and it mm. should be kept safe. Yes, yes. Talk to us about the kind of pressure that you've been under in, in that regard and how does NSF as a corporate institution balance out those pressures? The, we kind of help about eight years ago, and, I'm, and uh, Richard was really instrumental in leading us to that, we came up with what we call our strategic objectives for NSSF. It's a 10-year strategic objective, centered mm -hmm. on four key parameters. Mm -hmm. One, the growth of the fund, like I said, to 20 trillion. You can't grow 20 trillion unless your members are happy, 95% mm -hmm. satisfaction engagement. You cannot serve mem sta members with this grant of staff. So we need a 95 satisfaction for staff and then fix your processes so that it's seamless. They can, uh, if they want to be in their bedroom and register, they can do that. So processes we had then, and that was the one day turnaround and we just call it 2095-951. That's the, that's the, so everything we do around the fund is on that, with that focus. So whatever proposal anybody comes with, we measure it against the desire to deliver one or all of those four strategic objects. And we are so focused on that, mm. that it has actually the thing that has helped the fund grow. Even the driver knows where we want to be in 2025, because it's so clear. You can summarize our strategy on half a page, and people understand where you're going to go. Most companies are so scared of doing a strategy because it's, sitting, it's still sitting on the, what? Mm. On the shelf. Yeah. We don't, and that, that focus helped us. Do we get it wrong? Do we get it right all the time? No, we're humans, we don't. But we pivot, we change, we try, we experiment, we innovate to deliver those strategic objectives. And you know, the, the number of benchmarks people have come to find, how do you, how do you guys get there? Mm. It's incredible. 
I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things I can tell you, which is, uh, me, to me, is just yeah, amazing for the fund. One of the measures of efficiency across the globe, for pension funds our size, there are about 320 of them globally, in Asia, Europe, the US, uh, Australia, whatever it is, 300. That's about a $5 billion fund. One measure of efficiency is what's called cost of administration. How much is it costing you to run this fund based on your asset size? You take all your costs, all your costs, divided by your asset base. It gives you a cost of administration. Globally, the benchmark rate or the benchmark target is 2.2%. That's a number. That's mm. what everybody strives to do. To achieve. Mm. Our friends in Kenya are around now 2.7%. Our friends in Tanzania and something are 3 point something. And as of Uganda today, as of the end of last year, we are 1.16%. And we're driving that number towards 1%, and we'll, go, we'll exceed that number. Mm. That just tells you the measure of efficiency that we have as we to experiment with it. Not with the standing, the noise, the, you're wasting money, you see. But mm -hmm. that efficiency is incredible. And mm. we track it, we measure it, we follow it. Because it's in tracking that that now you're able to give the member value. Mm. But <laughs> how do you, you know, some of the anger from, from the savers is mm. really justified. Yeah. Um, for example, we just recently learned mm -hmm. in your CSR mm -hmm. activities, yes. some of that money goes to board members. Mm -hmm. We also learned that, you know, staff here, part of the, the way you keep them motivated is really taking them to luxury destinations. Mm -hmm. Savers have justified anger towards how that money is, is, is being spent. Yeah. But from a management perspective, do you have a justification for why you do those things the way that you do them so <laughs> that it benefits the saver at the end of the day? I think the thing, and I understand where members are upset. I think mm. one thing that maybe we forgot NSF, and I'm going to use where I think, the, to me, the biggest learning of this thing, mm. is that because you're dealing with a lot of money, a trillion shillings, a billion shillings, eh? when you say 10 million shillings, oh, no, remember, that's a lot of money. Mm. Whereas from our perspective, we are so focused on trying to deliver this big value that sometimes mm -hmm. we don't realize that you have to communicate better and bring clarity better so that the member can understand. Mm -hmm. I'll, give you a, I'll give you a very good example that you may show. Last year, mm -hmm. to declare 1% interest rate, to declare 1% interest rate was worth 141 billion shillings. This year, to declare 1% it will be about 160 billion shillings. 1%. 160 billion shillings to declare 1% interest rate. So if our targets to clear 10%, that means we need to have at least 1.6 trillion shillings this year in earnings to give the member that benefit. Mm -hmm. I look at people and I say, you know, let's think about this. Think you are the farmer. You have a farm. You come and you tell Patrick, Patrick, I'm going to hire you as a farm manager. I've hired an SSF. I'm giving you 200B as a budget. Mm -hmm. Now give me value. And last year, that value was 1.5 trillion shillings mm. in interest. You invested 200 billion, the interest you got was 1.5 trillion Five. shillings. Mm. Now, when you begin to look at it from that perspective, then, is, and you leave me manage the middle, what will it take, what motivation will it take to deliver that value, 1.5 trillion shillings? Mm. When you look at a productivity perspective, and this is where one of the things that in the or out of the hearing, mm. the focus was so much on the spend, the cost. Focus was never given on value. Mm. So let me just give you a couple of stats that will show, show, show you. Between 2021, the fund was 15.3 trillion shillings. 2022, the fund had grown to 15.6 no, 15 trillion shillings. By June 2022, the fund had grown to 17.3 trillion shillings, a 1.8 trillion shilling growth. The fund grew by 1.8 trillion shillings in that period. The total budget was 200 billion shillings. It means that for each spend in cost, we generate value for the member nine times. If you look at the cost, for each shilling we spent in staff costs, we generated 13 times value for the member. 
on its own, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's compare it with our neighbor because that's the nearest one we have. Mm. Same metrics, same year, same parameters. For each shilling they spent in course, they generated five times value. Remember, ours was eight. This is Kenya. Kenya. Yes. Kenya. Yes. Mm -hmm. For each shilling they spent on staff course, they generated nine times value. Ours was 13 times value. What makes this Ugandan NSSF staff to generate more value for NSF member in Uganda than their counterpart in Kenya? And therein lies the situation. Once you look at the totality of the picture, you realize, in fact, to me, I look at the predicate of NSF staff. I look at, uh, and you know what? Sometimes we Ugandans beat ourselves. Down. We think Kenyans are more hardworking than us. We mm. have such a bad opinion of ourselves. We can't even believe we can do things well and do it well. Mm. But I think NSF has shown that not ignoring the issues that may surface. Mm. That actually, you no, know, we Ugandans can work hard, we can deliver, we can bring value to our country if we just focus. And that means the biggest lesson that we've learned here. And you can compare NSF Uganda to any mm. entity today and you realize that as Ugandans, when we focus, mm. we can deliver value in this country. Mm. So uh, what lesson have you learned mm. through this, this grueling process? What lessons have you well, learned? And say these are things that we were not doing right that we now have to start paying attention to. Not, a, not everybody will understand you. I think that first part of it is there are things that we do here that not every company does. So they can't even believe you're doing those things. And the tendency is to default to the traditional known position. But so one thing is we have to bring clarity to the things that we do. We need to explain ourselves much better. We need to document a lot of the things that we do. And then we need to educate a lot of people or a lot of Ugandans. You guys, we can do better as a country. I think mm. when we focus on those things, we all grow together. Mm. Patrick, there, there are some questions that came from the public. I, I yes. hope that we can have them up on the screen there uh, and, and respond to them okay. one by one. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with Van Joses right there. Um, dear Patrick, I'd like to know why the savings I contribute ah. to NSF help to run the activities of unions, which I don't subscribe. Uh -huh. Can you find a way of separating us, non-union members mm -hmm. and union members? That's a very important question. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to answer it read this way. Many times, and we'll want to look at it from a global perspective, mm -hmm. okay? So we have these strategic elements we want to deliver for the member. What we want to do for the member, we get from uh, educating the member, complying, mm -hmm. driving compliance, driving the things that we need to do for those areas and so on. Now, when the law change, now we realize actually unions have certain reach we don't have. They can apply certain pressures to members who are not complying, to employers who are not complying, mm -hmm. that we can't. So in an overall perspective, what then you donate to the, to the union, empower them, help them, help the fund overall, because they, you, don't bring, you, don't, you cannot believe how many employers had refused, were being stubborn, were not wanting to comply. But because the union showed up at their gate, suddenly mm -hmm. those members are benefiting because the employer is complying. Mm -hmm. so, there is, so you have to look at the totality of it mm -hmm. to make sure that A, it helps us get there. Uh, why can't we get high interest? Interest, rates? yes, that's you Alan This interest figure you have been talking about is low compared to the asset base you have. Can we get more value, say 20% or 30%, like Mr. Matua said? My friend, what economy are you working with? I mean, mm -hmm. when you think about the economy today, GDP is growing at 5 6%. That's GDP. Mm. Even if you invested purely mm. in bonds in this market, mm. today maybe you'll get 16%. Okay? But there is a law in investment. You do not put all your investments in one basket called diversification. Mm. It's the number one um, way you de-risk your portfolio. That's why yeah. we have some money in real estate, we have some money in bonds, we have some money in equities. Mm. The blend of all that we give the member what we call the best adjusted return given the risk we want to take. Mm. So, th so when you look at it that way, 20%, 30%, I'm not sure where you're going to put it. Where you'll get that one actually in this region. No, you cannot. Mm. What you do, remember I told you guys that the best, the most attribute as an NSF will follow is safety, not mm. return, safety. That when you turn 55, mm. your money is there. Mm. But can you at least guarantee double digit interest? Year on year. Uh -uh. <laughs> or no. it's a hard one to guarantee. No, 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 you can't. Because mm. what affects investments? For example, today, in, in, you will be amazed. 
mm -hmm. thing that's affecting the most return to us today in Uganda, today, our shilling is strengthening. Now you may say, what, why, if our shilling is strengthening, why is that reducing the return I can get? Mm -hmm. Because like our di diversification, we've placed some money in Tanzania, in Kenya. When the Uganda shilling strengthens against the Kenya shillings, when I revalue each month, mm -hmm. the best example is, let's say you went and bought a cow in Kenya, and the cow costs you 10,000 Kenya shillings. At that time, the exchange rate between you, the Uganda shilling and the Kenya shilling, mm -hmm. is 30 shillings. Yes. Which means, to buy that cow, I need to buy 30 times 10,000. I, th I need to have 300,000 shillings worth of Uganda shillings. Yeah. So in my books, I record 300,000 shillings. I bought a cow in Kenya. Kenya. Mm -hmm. Then the shilling strengthens. Now I don't need 30 shillings to buy a cow in Kenya. I need 25 shillings. Mm -hmm. So now on my Uganda books, I still have the cow in Kenya, 10,000. But mm -hmm. on my Uganda books now, I recognize that exchange movement. Mm -hmm. So now I'll be, I'll be recording it at 250,000. Mm -hmm. Is what you call unrealized movement of gains and things. We take in total to all that. And that's mm -hmm. why I can't guarantee you that mm -hmm. it will be that. Why? Because I have no idea what this economy is going to do vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the rest or of the world. What it's going to look like. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I think we already answered this one on, on the plan for people who can't afford yes, expensive exactly. houses. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just clarify which other areas you're mm -hmm. investing in that are cheap and low cost. Mm -hmm. Chanja, Temangalo. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, why do board members meet in Nairobi? Why is recruitment highly nepotistic? Why should I really have a director the ones with a chance to join the fund? I think the, the, uh, the question we answered, number two, why is recruitment? Yeah, we already answered we that. We already answered that one. The, yes. And th I think still NSF actually is one of the areas you join on merit. Actually, they do. Mm. We actually try that as much as we can. Why do board members meet in Nairobi? In fact, mm. the reason why they met in Nairobi because of the combination of a meeting and a training. Mm. So the two were, were done one instead of having them do mm. differently. Yeah. Um, there's a question there. Um, can members get, just go to the next slide. Can members get loans off their savings with NSSF before we approach 45 or 55? That's from Betty to Musime. Yeah, Betty, there is actually a proposal we are having. One of the amendments that the law gave us was to be able to come up with the different products. Mm. If you notice about uh, two months ago, three months ago, Ubra came up with the uh, product within the Ubra laws mm. where a member can apply for a facility when they are buying a residential property, property. Mm. but used as collateral. In other words, if somebody has 100 million shillings in NSF, mm. they could use 50 million shillings of it as collateral. So now, from the banker's eyes, the member is de risked. Because in addition to the property, mm. they've there also, a there's a fund that they mm. can actually utilize. However, we have to have an amendment done to the NSSF Act to enable, because there's a specific NSSF Act that doesn't allow that. So we need, we are now in the talks with, to make sure that can come to Parliament. That clause can be amended. Mm. Then members can now use their savings for collateral. Mm. Yes. Okay, that, that, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> same question down mm. there. If you can lend money to business in Uganda, Clays, why can't you lend money uh, to members against their savings? The, the loan to Uganda Clays was done in 2010, mm. before the law stopping lending mm. came. The law stopping pension funds from lending came in 2011 yeah. under UBRA. So that was the last loan we mm. lent, because by, at this point in time, we can't even lend anybody any money. Mm. But this is why I'm going to challenge you, Ugandan. Please, we all, we have members of parliament from where we are. If you really want it that hard, mm. please tell your member of parliament so they can actually pass an amendment because you don't want us mm. to, yeah. and to commit mm. an illegal but, act. Uh, um, Patrick, there's, there's a question down there mm. which is closely linked to the same. Yes. Um, mm. Why don't you, NSF, who are the big guns in the trade, uh -huh push for the law to be amended? Why don't you show up before Parliament mm. and, and tell them, look here, we need this amendment? The way I, you push it for midterm. Actually, do we have, a number of, the, we have a number of proposals that we're going to push. One of those is that. But mm. when we get there, at least you get members, talk, mm. contact your members of Parliament, mm. so it's much easier for them to understand. Mm. But those are things that we want to push. Yeah. Uh, Muhereza Amon is asking, is there any plan for people without national identification who wish to contribute to NSF? I think voluntary <laughs> savings. That's it. it we, had an ex we had a staff meeting today and they came up. Mm. Now, two things. NSF is not an island. Today, we have to be linked to a bank for you to be able to pay mm. your benefits. We are linked within the telecoms. Mm. All these entities require national IDs, yep. which means that if you come and join NSF and you don't have a national ID, you, you won't be able to pay you. You won't be able to do any other things that we have. But let mm. me ask you, uh, Amon, and this is really, it bothers me a little bit. 
why wouldn't you as a Ugandan want to have a national ID? It's the only, it's now the official mm. identity document okay. for us as Ugandans. Mm. And everything you do is going to be based on that national ID. Let's get these things because mm. it helps everybody when we do it. Mm. There's a question from Richard Nyanzi. The best performing stock has been Umeme mm. and they are exiting. What's the strategy for, for NSSF? I have to be careful how I answer that because we are the, <laughs> we are the, we are the largest shareholder. Yes, I, I know. But I think in general I can say that it doesn't matter what happens. The members' funds are safe simply because built in the share agreement are guarantees to protect all shareholders. Mm. So it doesn't really matter what happens. We are protected mm. in terms of that. Mm. But th th that's all the questions we had, and Thank I you. think that's all the time we had. But I, I want to I want you to kind of know NSF today is an institution. It's bigger than any one person, whether it's myself, whether it's somebody below. And the very structures we've put into place are what safeguards the fund. We've, we are still investing as due diligently as we do. We are still paying people their money as they come. We are still ensuring that when you become eligible, your money is going to come there. The one thing I appeal to you, look at NSF from a portfolio perspective in a totality. Don't be swayed there by just one thing plugged out. Because when you put it back in the context of the decision we make, you'll actually realize that we make more right decisions for you than wrong ones. And that is important to emphasize. The fund has not grown by accident. From 1.7 trillion to 18 trillion, not by accident. Because there were deliberate steps that we took to make sure that this fund remains as, vi as viable, variant as it can. In the next 20 years, in the next 50 years, mm -hmm. that's the intent. Mm. All right. Thank, thank, you, thank so you so much, Patrick. And thank you so much, everyone who's been part of this space, who's been watching us live. Um, this space has been recorded, so you can play it back and listen. If you have any questions, you can really pass through those questions um, to the NSF UG handle. Um, if even to my handle, I'll pass it on to the NSF team um, to have responses to that. But that's all we've been able to put into this morning. So thank you so much and have yourselves a good morning. Thank you very much. Yes.